Welcome to part two of the monster ranking for Glory of the Giants. We now look toward B tier in which the creatures will tilt and their upsides clearly outweigh their downsides. Kicking off low B tier is the Hill Giant Avalancher. This is a hill giant that wields rune magic and carries with her lots of rocks for rune inscription and some good old fashioned throwing. This creature is supposed to be a druid, it's tagged as a druid, but it only has four spells and no other druid features. It is one in a group of giants in this book that wield rune magic. Its stat block actually has stats for a rock with a hill rune that the giant wears or carries on it. Characters can actually target, damage, destroy, maybe even steal this rune, and if it does get destroyed or taken away, the giant cannot use a couple of its key magical features. The Avalancher has Legendary Resistance, a great club that deals bludgeoning damage and mystery thunder damage, and Magical Stone Bullis that it throws to deal thunder damage and restrain the target. Its hill rune gives it two other abilities. One is a stone avalanche with an area of falling rocks that deals bludgeoning damage and knocks creatures prone, and the other rune ability is a hill rebuff, a reaction when the avalanche takes damage, allowing it to blast the attacker with force damage, knock it prone, and push it 10 feet away. The next creature is another of the giants that are rune carvers, the frost giant ice shaper, who has some really nice artwork. This giant typically worships the giant god Thrym, and is either a Jarl of a frost giant clan, or perhaps the head advisor to the Jarl. It follows the same pattern as the hill giant Avalancher, in which it wears a rune inscribed on ice or some other object, and that gives it a couple of different magical powers. But again, the characters can try to destroy or maybe even steal the rune to deprive the giant of these powers. The Ice Shaper wields a Great Axe, which I believe has a damage typo. It's showing D10s instead of D12s for the slashing damage, and of course, it also deals mysterious cold damage. It has a Freezing Ray that's a ranged spell attack, dealing cold damage and restraining the target. It can also create wolves out of ice. They have the same stats as Winter Wolves. And, as a reaction, it can cover itself with ice armor to block an attack, and the ice then shatters in a short-range burst of cold damage. Like with the Hill Giant Avalancher, the Ice Shaper is noted with a character class. This time it's Cleric, but it doesn't actually have any Cleric features or any spells at all, so I'm puzzled by what this is supposed to mean. Up next, and I mean really up there, big and tall, is the Flesh Colossus, which is essentially a gargantuan-sized flesh golem. Massive construct made out of the bodies of giants that are fused together with an adamantine skeleton to hold it all. It attacks with its fists, then grabs up targets. It bites and swallows them. Inside the Flesh Colossus's torso is a core of stone infused with elemental spirits. Swallowed creatures can attempt to destroy the core, and if they do, the Colossus goes berserk, much like a Flesh Golem does. The Colossus can also exhale a cloud of elemental energy, dealing its choice of acid, cold, fire, or lightning damage in an enormous cone area, and simultaneously the swallowed creatures inside it take the same amount of damage but as force damage. In some ways, this creature is as simple as Frankenstein's monster, maybe even less intelligent than that, but in other ways it is a stunning and freakishly amazing titan with some incredibly interesting and fun abilities. The giant goose is another of the big fey animals in the book, and this one immediately appealed to me as it is reminiscent of the goose from Jack and the Beanstalk, fantastic, classic giant story of acclaim. Indeed, this D&D giant goose can lay golden eggs though only once per year and a day. Sometimes, a golden egg has a little treasure inside, a little trinket, and this creature even comes with its own trinket random roll table, which I think is just excellent. The giant goose can even fight, biting with its beak, smacking with its wings, which can knock the target prone, the favored condition to inflict for this book, and the goose has a magical honk that deals thunder damage and deafens creatures. The classic style and the role-playing and hijinks and storytelling that this creature can easily lead to really are some strong points. 
The stalker of Baphomet is next in the cycle of giants turned into fiends. This time, it's a stone giant who became a demon, influenced by Baphomet, the demon lord of savagery, hunting, and minotaurs. These stone giants are particularly drawn to the labyrinth constructing aspect of cultists of Baphomet. They go on to fashion their own mazes in which prey and victims are placed and the bloodthirsty stalker hunts them down. It wields a glaive that, by its stats, is actually suited to a large sized creature, not a huge size, and the glaive also deals, get ready for it, mysterious force damage. The stalker can throw rocks that knock a target prone, it can cast the spells meld into stone, stone shape, and wall of stone, which are some great spells and very fitting for this creature, and it can call up horns of stone from the ground, like big spikes, which deal quite a lot of piercing damage to creatures in the area, and toss them up in the air, only to immediately fall back down for some falling damage, because these amazing stone horns crumble to dust right after they appear. That's so weird to me. For one, it's a missed opportunity to have the stone horns be permanent, or at least a longer duration, and that's going to cause a dynamic change to the encounter terrain. And for two, if you think about it, it's just ridiculous that this powerful demon giant can conjure these spikes, but it cannot sustain them at all, so they always just disintegrate to dust every time right after they rise up from the ground. It gives the feature this kind of video gamey feel. Nonetheless, I do think this is a pretty interesting creature and could be easily modified into something really excellent. The Troll Amalgam is one of the craziest and most incredible trolls I've ever seen. It's over the top, overwhelming, just bewildering. This rare kind of troll is actually the body parts of lots of trolls that were put together like in a heap or a pit and then they regenerated into this fused mixture, an amalgam of course. It is a gargantuan size mass of troll parts. It's remarkably powerful, CR 17 with legendary resistance. It attacks with flurries of rending claws and even throws its limbs at enemies which grab and restrain them. We move to mid B tier now. The Goliath Giant Kin is one of the very few humanoids in this bestiary. They are about as big as creatures can be and still be considered medium size. They're distantly related to giants, but still have a connection to giant religion and giant powers in certain ways. The best thing about the Goliath giant kin is that you could do so much with it as a GM. You could feature it in about any kind of scene or adventure. Other than that though, it's not very interesting where its abilities are concerned. It only has one unique feature to speak of called giant strikes, which funny enough, is designed completely different than the many creatures in this book in that it must use this feature to channel mystical power that enhances its weapon with extra energy damage. Cold if it's related to frost giants, fire for fire giants, force for stone giants, lightning for storm giants, piercing for hill giants, or thunder for cloud giants. So in this case, it's not mystery damage, the lore and the stat block actually explain where the magic, or at least the temporary magic that it's channeling into its weapon is coming from, and how it works. Huh. The Fire Giant of Evil Fire is the next entry in the cycle of giants that serve elemental evil. It's an all-around pretty solid monster. It's not amazing, but it's decently good. It can shoot powerful fire bolts that also frighten the target, and in melee it attacks with a searing scepter that deals bludgeoning damage and fire damage, and causes the target to lose invisibility and not be able to benefit from invisibility for a duration. The fire enhancement to the scepter is actually not a mystery in this case, because the lore says that the fire giant forges its armor and scepter, which is then blessed by Imix, the prince of evil fire, thus imbuing this burning energy into the weapon. Of course, this then begs the question if the characters can wield the scepter, maybe as like a maul, or perhaps magically shrink it so they can use it more readily, or maybe enlarge themselves and then wield it? Or does Imix somehow know that the giant has died and then he removes his blessing? What if the characters don't actually kill the giant though? What if they just knock it out, imprison it, charm it, then take its powerful magical scepter? In any case, 
not killing it would actually be a good tactic, because when the giant is reduced to zero hit points, it and its armor explode in a burst of shrapnel. On the adjacent page in the book is the fire giant Forge Collar, who is not a follower of Imix, but the fire entry in the rune magic wielder cycle in Glory of the Giants. It is a veritable walking forge and volcano rolled into one. It attacks with a massive hammer that bludgeons and afflicts the target with a heat metal type effect. It throws hot rocks that bludgeon and deal fire damage and knock the targets prone. It can unleash waves of lava that burn intensely hot and then harden to solid upon the targets, restraining them. And to aid its defense, it can emit thick smoke that makes it a little harder for tax to hit it. On top of all of this, it has legendary resistance and flying, though once again, this giant is categorized as a cleric without possessing any cleric spells or channel divinity or anything that's related to the cleric class. The Fearbolg Primeval Warden is the next of only three humanoids in this bestiary and one of only six medium-sized creatures. As a humanoid, it is highly versatile, so you could do so much with it, feature it in all kinds of different scenes with all sorts of different motivations or roles. Fearbolgs also are distant cousins of giants, and they have a connection to the giant goddess of nature, agriculture, hunting, women, and children. The primeval warden thus is best known for protecting and rearing their communities and guarding the surrounding region. These roles encompass so much, so it makes it a very flexible creature. It is tagged as a druid, and this time, haha, it actually has druidic magic, with spells that cover everything from combat, to role-playing, to divination, to stealth and trickery. Next we have another new kind of giant kin coming onto the 5e scene, the Finseer. Specifically here is the Finseer Skirmisher. These creatures used to be trolls long ago. They embarked on a campaign to the plain of Yisgard, properly known as the Heroic Domains of Yisgard, also referred to as Glodsheim. This is an outer plain that fits between the alignments of Chaotic Good and Chaotic Neutral. It is inspired by Norse mythology. And on this plane, creatures are regenerated over and over to take part in a glorious yet brutal eternal battle. The trolls, over time, transformed into the Finseer on the plane of Yisgard. The Finseer skirmisher has regeneration much like a troll, and like certain trolls of Middle Earth, sunlight turns them to stone. It fights with a battle axe and magic stones and can also throw a huge area of bludgeoning mud that quickly solidifies, potentially causing creatures in the area to be petrified, or, in the brand new phrasing style, to have the petrified condition. To round out its features, the Finseer Skirmisher can cast the spells Create or Destroy Water, Detect Magic, and Pass Without Trace. This is another solid creature, though I am confused as to why it's referred to as a skirmisher. There's nothing skirmisher about it. Skirmishing usually has to do with high mobility or other movement-based effects, of which this creature has none. It doesn't even have a fast walking speed, just a regular 30 feet. A more accurate name would have been something like Earth Shaman. The next cult of elemental evil creature is the Cloud Giant of Evil Air. It is aligned with Yan Si Bin, which sounds like a name for a Star Wars character, but he is actually the Prince of Evil Air. As a cloud giant, it brings cunning, charisma, and riches to the table. I found the final paragraph of the lore interesting. It says, A cloud giant dedicated to evil air wears a magic vest adorned with wings made from rock feathers and enchanted with elemental air, allowing the giant to fly. The vest functions only for the giant who wears it. This cloud giant has flying mobility, a scimitar, and a storm boomerang that deals bludgeoning, mysterious thunder, and can mysteriously stun the target. This is really a magic weapon that the characters would love to get their hands on. The giant can also cast all of the innate spells as the core monster manual cloud giant can, like fog cloud, gaseous form, and telekinesis. The second death giant in the bestiary is 
the Shrouded One. It looks much more like the death giants we all know from D&D. It uses rune magic and inscribes them onto skulls of the mightiest foes it has slain. Like the other rune giants in the book, the runic item gives the giant a couple powers, though, again, characters can potentially destroy or otherwise divest the giant of the item. It has a soul burst feature, which is a melee or ranged spell attack that deals necrotic damage and frightens the target. It also has a reaping scythe melee spell attack that deals a ton of necrotic damage and prevents the target from healing until the end of its next turn. Wait a minute, until the end of the target's next turn? Shouldn't that say until the end of the giant's next turn? Otherwise, the target could just get healed by an ally after its turn and before the giant's turn. That has to be a typo. Like the other rune wielders, this giant gets a class categorization, this time as wizard. And lo and behold, it actually has a few wizard spells. Detect magic, mage armor to bring its AC from pathetic to just bad, speak with dead, and tensor's floating disc. Meh. A wizard at CR 15 without any powerful wizard spells. But we're not done yet. It has two more unique bonus actions. First, a short range teleport that also frightens nearby creatures, like the other death giant has, and a shroud of souls, hearkening back to the classic death giant powers, in which it surrounds itself with a wreath of captured souls, and enemies that begin their turn within five feet of the giant must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or have disadvantage on saves till the end of their next turn. Well, hmm. Disadvantage on saves is a very powerful effect, but it's not so easy to inflict. And what saves does this shrouded one actually cause enemies to make? The save against frightened when it teleports away? I guess just that. <sighs> This death giant is pretty good in some ways, but it really could be better. I'd say that this kind of describes my feeling about this book as I'm going through it. And while I'm criticizing things, I've just realized that not a single monster in this book has legendary actions. There are lots and lots of high or even extremely high challenge rating monsters, but none of them have legendary actions. What's the deal with that? Legendary actions are awesome, and they're a great way for a monster to interact well with a whole party's worth of action economy. It's also a way to help the legendary monster still act in various situations in which its main actions on its actual turn get taken away by some spell or some effect. Ah. Continuing on, still in mid-B tier, is the Stone Giant Rock Speaker, the rune carver for stone giants, which actually is the most fitting kind of giant to have runic magic. It is known for being the leader or majestic oracle of its clan, and in general it's a stylish, powerful, and versatile creature. It's tagged as being a wizard, so let's see what wizard features and spells it has. None? Not a single one! Alrighty then. It attacks with a prism staff that deals bludgeoning and mysterious radiant damage, it throws exploding geodes, and it wields prismatic rays, which is like a simplified version of the prismatic ray spell. Another thing I'm noticing more and more is the repeated use of these same conditions over and over again. The target has frightened, the target has blinded, the target has prone. Sure, we should expect the core conditions to come up with a certain frequency, but this book seems to rely on them a little too much it should be giving creatures more unique features, something that we haven't seen time and time again. It's starting to remind me a little bit of 4th edition in that way. Moving on, we come across the Tempest Spirit. Storm giants can avoid death by turning into a storm through a mystical ritual. But if done in a place where the barrier is thin between the material plane and the shadow fell, they become Tempest Spirits, which resemble Jin actually. These spirits may seek to undo the transformation in solitude, or they might become hyper-aggressive, releasing destructive elements and necrotic energy upon those nearby. The Achilles heel for the Tempest Spirit is that its AC is extremely low. Otherwise, it is incorporeal like a ghost, it has legendary resistance, attacks with lightning fists and hailstones, and can hurl necromantic bolts that deal lightning and necrotic damage and reduce the target's maximum HP. As a bonus action, it can conjure a big hailstorm that deals bludgeoning damage and cold damage and knocks creatures prone. 
Our next specimen is the Etin Ceramorph. Mind flayers, aka illithids, use a process called ceramorphosis to transform humanoids into more mind flayers by implanting illithid tadpoles in their brains. After many experiments on giants failed due to their size, Etins were found to be suitable hosts, resulting in Etin ceramorphs. One head controls the body, and the other one possesses psionic power. These transformed creatures serve Mind Flayer colonies, protecting Elder Brains and their treasures with no memory of their previous existence as Etins. It's essentially a hybrid of a giant kin body with Mind Flayer abilities. It gives some fantastic features that we know from the Mind Flayer stat block, the grappling and stunning tentacles, brain extraction, mind bolt, and it itself is one of those rare creatures that's actually immune to being stunned. I do wish the image wasn't so clean and polished and simplified looking, because this could be a really freaky monster if it were rendered more gritty and horror fantasy style. But its abilities are terrifying and shocking enough to probably make an everlasting impression on the players. The Troll Mutate is next. Wait, Troll Mutate? Not Troll Mutant? Huh. Trolls exposed to corrupting alien energy, like those near Far Realm gates or even in the Underdark, can develop strange mutations, including wings, stretchable bodies, magic resistance, and psychic properties, along with things like additional limbs, eyes, externalized organs. The thing I like most about this creature is that it can have one of four possible mutations, though it could have been even better. What I did with the Abyssal Elf in Esper's Emporium was to give it a list of eight potential mutations, and the GM rolls for two of them at random. The combinations and mixing and matching makes for more surprises and creative replay value. But hey, four mutations is still kind of cool. They are Amorphous, Magic Resistance, Psychic Rebuke, and Winged Form. The Troll Mutate also has Regeneration, a Rend melee attack, and Psychic Burst. It's a fireball level damage, but psychic damage, in a 30 foot radius. Another strange and peculiar take on the troll. I gotta say, I like it. In high B tier stands the Gargantua. Gargantuas are occasionally born to giant parents, but their true nature emerges as they grow, turning purplish with horns and reaching to heights of 40 feet or more. These colossal creatures often don't even fit within giant communities, so they go out and seek solitude in places like ancient forests, deep canyons, or even the Underdark. Some of them seek peace, others react aggressively due to the world's fears of them. Giants have various legends explaining their origin, connecting them to the Far Realm, or the banished son of Anam, or just Anam's general disgust with his descendants. The Gargantua has a weird aura that assaults nearby creatures' minds and makes them see the Gargantua as a representation of their worst fears. In physical combat, it attacks with good old slams and thrown rocks, and it has two bonus actions, a hex that incapacitates a creature for one round and a 120-foot teleport. It also has two choices of reaction. One is called Flick, when the Gargantua takes damage from a large or smaller creature, it can smack the creature so hard that it gets knocked back an incredible 100 feet. The other reaction is a once per day spell mimicry, copying up to a 5th level spell unless the caster succeeds on a charisma save. Really cool effect there. I wish the Gargantua could use it more than just once. Really neat creature, though again, I'm not a huge fan of the really clean, polished, cartoon, simple look. The other Finseer in the book is the Finseer Devourer. Finseers on Yisgard transform after around a thousand years, growing to 25 feet, becoming voracious devourers with immense strength and having the ability to issue a deadly curse before their demise. Again, a troll kin thing here. It has regeneration and that hypersensitivity to sunlight that can turn it to stone. His attacks are very simple, just a slam and a throwing rock that bludgeons and knocks prone, though it has a death curse that causes creatures to be unable to benefit from short and long rests, and they must succeed on a charisma save every hour or take psychic damage. Unfortunately, the curse only lasts 24 hours. 
The creature has potential for greatness, but just doesn't quite get there. The saving quality is that its style is incredible, thanks in large part to the fantastic illustration by Arash Radkia. The Fearbulg Wanderer wanders into sight now. It's the last of the very few number of humanoids and medium-sized creatures in this rogues gallery. They are wayfaring tricksters who worship the giant goddess Diancastra, who, by the way, has many little quotes in this book, often sharing tiny nuggets of knowledge or quips with Big B. Oh, gee gosh, these two are so cool. Let me tell you, this is sort of a love-hate monster for me. On the one hand, it has a variety of different abilities, attacks, spells, it can fight in melee or at a decent range, and it can target creatures with hideous laughter and polymorph spells. Also, as a bonus action, it can make an illusory duplicate of itself. It's a very dynamic, very versatile kind of monster. Plus, come on, we all love tricksters and scoundrels. But on the other hand, I'm not a big fan of a goofy blue-skinned elf with modern-day hip haircut. Its charming power also blasts a creature's mind with psychic damage, which I do find odd. It's kind of hard to be charmed into adoring someone who is simultaneously shooting you. It's classed as a cleric, but it casts no cleric spells, like it cannot heal. A cleric who cannot heal is no cleric at all. Getting back to the cycle of giants turned undead is the Spectral Cloud, which is not the same as the Tempest Spirit we saw just a moment ago. When cloud giants meet their end through betrayal or unfortunate wagers, they may become spectral clouds, with a shadowy figure within, a skeletal cloud giant corpse at the center. In other tales, cloud giants even sometimes intentionally seek out this fate through a kind of heart transplant ritual with the intention to extend their lives. It is also an incorporeal monster, and it has a blurred form trait that gives disadvantage on attacks against the spectral cloud from more than 15 feet away. I applaud whoever designed this. It's a unique feature that impacts combat in a dynamic way. Sort of like with a wraith, a spectral cloud has a life draining touch that reduces the max HP and raises slain humanoids as specters. It also has another great ability called Chilling Winds, which despite a less than epic name, deals a bunch of cold damage in a 10 foot wide, 60 foot long line and renders targets incapacitated for a minute with a whopping save DC of 20. Woo, yeah. The top of B tier is the Grinning Cat, AKA the Cheshire Cat of D&D. Grinning cats are mischievous fey resembling oversized cats with wide toothy smiles, often found near giant enclaves. They enjoy perplexing travelers with riddles and can even gift their whiskers, which allow the holder to cast Misty Step once before the whisker turns to smoke. The Grinning Cat has amazing role-playing potential, and coupled with that are a few really cool features. It can become invisible, though it can choose to have parts of itself remain visible, like hovering eyes or a hovering mouth there, a la the encounter in Alice in Wonderland. It attacks with a bite or claws, or even both together if it pounces a creature while it's invisible. It can also teleport up to 60 feet at will as a bonus action, making it a fantastic magical trickster and skirmisher. I do have to say, it kind of reminds me of the Enigma Cat from Esper's Emporium. Though mine is tiny size, it can temporarily learn first level spells that it sees being cast, and it can potentially become a familiar. What coincidences, eh? That wraps up B tier, and wow, there were a lot of creatures in it. Most of them still are lacking in some areas, or maybe even have some kind of annoying or nonsensical bits to them, but they also have plenty of decent or even great qualities that I have to give recognition to. That said, man, am I ready to jump into A tier. Let's take a look at the high quality creatures from Glory of the Giants. The second Fomorian in this ranking is the Fomorian Noble, which kicks off low A tier. Ambitious and power hungry Fomorians who sought to further their knowledge and their magic left the material plane for the inner planes before their kin were banished to the Underdark. These Fomorian Nobles actually resemble giant elves because they were not around when the rest of their race were cursed and deformed. 
Many of the nobles are even unaware of the suffering of their kind. At least so says the bit of lore here. Actually, I do find that a bit hard to believe that they somehow have never found out about this, but whatever. The nobles periodically return to the material plane from their remote enclaves, appearing ageless and unchanged. The Fomorian noble really is just all around good. It doesn't really have a downside, except maybe the lore could have been developed a bit more. It's a powerful CR-15 monster that attacks with a rod that deals bludgeoning and mysterious force damage, can cast a number of spells, sort of like an evoker wizard, and as a bonus action, it can use a beguiling presence to charm a creature. The Storm Herald immediately caught my eye with some amazing artwork by Katarina Ladon. Ancient beings and ocean depths sometimes influence storm giants, transforming them into storm heralds with a monstrous appearance, psychic powers, and unwavering loyalty. These heralds may attempt to recruit other storm giants, or they may cultivate other kinds of followers to serve the oceanic entities that they also now serve. Unfortunately, the lore stops a bit short on this creature. It doesn't say what exactly the Storm Heralds do. They are CR 17 after all, and they have some amazing combat abilities. You don't need all of that just to be a recruiter and an organizer. Do they just help their masters as needed? Also, the name Storm Herald doesn't seem like quite the right name for this creature. It's too general. It doesn't sound mighty. It doesn't sound weird or eldritch enough. Other than these little nitpicks, this is an excellent creature. It attacks with claws, tentacles that restrain and deal psychic damage, and a trident that deals piercing and mysterious lightning damage. It can send out a psychic wave that deals psychic damage and stuns up to three creatures, and it has some spells such as detect thoughts, which is a wonderful combo with its innate telepathy, it also has control water and control weather for impacts on travel sequences and combat terrain, along with the sending spell, which is a really interesting spell from a role-playing standpoint. The third and final Fomorian is the Warlock of the Dark, and this brings us into mid-A tier. Certain Fomorians, seeking to regain the arcane glory lost in their banishment to the Underdark, make packs with dark entities, such as Fey Lords of the Gloaming Court, or maybe even Eldritch Masters that dwell down in the subterranean depths. This giant Fomorian warlock has the ability to manipulate shadows like clay. This creature is another of the rune carver cycle in this book, and it carves what are called blood runes. It actually has a variety of attacks and abilities at its disposal, making it a really dynamic enemy to fight. It wields a great club that deals bludgeoning and mysterious necrotic damage. It has a corrupting hex that is an amazingly strong feature. It inflicts a bunch of necrotic damage and curses the target for 24 hours such that its speed is reduced by half. And whenever it casts a spell, it must succeed on a DC 16 intelligence save or the spell fails. <laughs> the Warlock of the Dark also has an Eldritch Burst and six different spells, along with a creeping gloom bonus action that creates an area of darkness that can blind enemies and deal damage to them. Topping it all off, it has a reaction that can poison creatures that damage it. Fantastic bad guy here. Going right into high A tier, we have a cycle of six primordial cradles and their associated titan scions. It's like this. There is a primordial cradle for each of the true giants. So a cradle of the frost scion, cradle of the storm scion, and so forth. These creatures begin in their so-called cradle form, which is a gargantuan elemental creature. When it drops to zero hit points, it dissipates or crumbles, and a scion of the associated giant god appears in its space. In other words, there are two creatures in one, like a boss monster that has an initial form and a final form. They are extremely powerful, ranging from CR 22 to CR 27. So we're talking the power level of Demon Lords, Archfey, Exarchs, Great Worm Dragons, and so forth. It's difficult to rank them against each other because they're so close to each other. Essentially, they all have the same scores. I did try to arrange them according to how interesting I thought each one is, but really, I'm just splitting hairs here. 
The Primordial Cradles have five uses of Legendary Resistance, Magic Resistance, Epic Combat Abilities, and Regional Effects. The Titan Scions of the Giant Gods have six uses of Legendary Resistance, along with the Magical Resistance, and some of the same combat abilities, but also some different ones. They also do have the same regional effects. And let me tell you, these regional effects are quite interesting, and they can have a tremendous impact. For each cradle, it has two unique effects that fit the style and the theme of its element slash giant type, along with one regional effect that they all have in common, giving a bonus to attack and damage rolls of all associated types of giants within 1,000 feet of the primordial cradle. So for example, all fire giants within 1,000 feet of the fire scion cradle get this bonus to attack and damage rolls. And how much is the bonus to attack and damage rolls, you ask? I mean, even a plus two or a plus three would be really nice. But no, the bonus equals the cradle's proficiency bonus, which at this extremely high CR is either a plus seven or a plus eight. Just imagine fighting a CR 27 Cradle of the Storm Scion, along with its storm giant allies that each have plus eight to all their attacks and damage rolls. Then once you defeat the Cradle, a CR 27 Scion of the God Strawn Mouse appears, still providing that bonus to its storm giant allies. Wow. Hats off to these guys. They might not have legendary actions, but what they do have is of truly epic proportion. These things are undoubtedly worthy foes for characters of level 17 through 20, the fourth tier of play, when the decisions and the events have worldwide or even multi-planar consequences. A slumbering scion of Thrym resembles a glacier and it dreams of battle until it is disturbed, at which point its icy cradle animates, attacking intruders with ice and frigid air. If the cradle is destroyed, it reveals the 70-foot-tall awakened scion of Thrym, which wields a double-bladed axe and create and hurl glaciers at foes. A slumbering scion of Suerter, at the peak of a volcano, causes constant plumes of smoke and volcanic activity as it dreams of battles and conquest. If disturbed, its cradle transforms into a molten juggernaut, launching magma, fiery gases, and molten stone. And if the cradle is destroyed, a 60-foot-tall scion of Suerter emerges, shrouded in ash and smoke eager to lead a fire giant army in campaigns of conquest. A slumbering scion of Grolantor is often mistaken for a hill. It even supports thriving settlements thanks to its magical influence on agriculture. When awakened, the hill's cradle transformed into a creature with dirt, stone, and root limbs capable of entangling and entombing enemies. If the cradle is destroyed, the 50-foot-tall scion inside emerges, consuming everything nearby and using a whole tree as a great club. A scion of Scoreus slumbers deep within a mountain, where its dreams transform minerals into precious gems and carving stones. When miners approach too closely, the mountain's cradle awakens as a stone and crystal entity, causing tremors and collapsing tunnels. If the cradle gets destroyed, the 70-foot-tall Scion of Scoreus emerges, wielding a crystalline great club, still pursuing the art of stone crafting, and even turning living creatures into stone to use for such purposes. A Scion of Strawnmouth slumbers high in the sky or even deep in the ocean, causing storms and maelstroms when too close to the ground or the surface. Their slumber is filled with varying types of dreams, and if the scion is threatened or disturbed by nightmares, its cradle becomes a giant-shaped entity of ice, water, and air. If the cradle is destroyed, an 80-foot-tall scion emerges, not necessarily hostile, but at least indifferent to smaller creatures, and it can unleash cataclysmic elemental powers when threatened. A slumbering scion of Mimnor appears as a constant cloud over a remote valley, leading to a superstitious behavior among the creatures living beneath it. 
When awakened, the cradle of the Cloud Scion transforms into a massive air elemental, wielding air and thunder as weapons. If the cradle is destroyed, the 75-foot-tall Scion of Mimnor emerges, with a morning star made of solidified clouds. It toys with other creatures, using powerful illusions on them, or if it is threatened, it unleashes devastating thunder and wind. That concludes A tier, and the creatures we saw were distinctly of higher quality than the previous tiers. Any one of them would be a blast to run. They are all of high or even extremely high challenge ratings, so I do wish that we saw more of this tier of monster for low and mid challenge ratings. Now we reach the summit, my brave companions, the best and the most glorious of the giants in this bestiary, and there are only two of them. In low S tier is the Cloud Giant Destiny Gambler, another of the Rune Carver cycle. Cloud Giants rise in status by accumulating treasures through gambling, and Destiny Gamblers excel in high stakes wagers. They wear magical masks that grant them exceptional vision, including the ability to see through illusions and magical trickery. They are so confident in their abilities that they invite rivals to name the terms of the wagers, proving their nearly unmatched magical prowess in combat challenges. The Cloud Giant is my favorite of the true giants. I think they are the most interesting, the most versatile, the most nuanced of them all. Their themes often include some great things like oracles and tricksters and complex dual natures. The Destiny Gambler is considered a bard, which is cool to me, though it does not necessarily mean something positive. There are plenty of annoying bards out there, plenty of stupid stereotyping the bard is just a guy who always has a loot in his hands and is always joking or smirking. This Cloud Giant bard is done extremely well though. It has a staff that can be used in melee or at a range, dealing bludgeoning plus mysterious thunder damage. It can cast some different spells, including Dream and Major Image, which are two spells that I absolutely love. They're just so creative, they're so flexible in what you can do with them. I love dream sequences, and the dream spell provides scenes in which the NPC shapes the character's dream, then either talks to him or tries to disturb him with a nightmare. The Destiny Gambler also has a thunderous clap feature, which is a massive area of high thunder damage that knocks creatures prone and leaves a heavily obscured cloud for a round. The Cloud Giant can actually see through this cloud, thanks to its 30 feet of true sight. And to put a wondrous cherry on top, the Destiny Gambler has a counterspell type reaction that it can use every round. If the spell is third level or lower, it just gets countered. But if it's higher than third level, the spell's caster must succeed on a DC 18 intelligence save or lose the spell. This is a really awesome monster, so great in many ways, I almost gave it the top slot in this ranking. However, I have to recognize the spectacular glory of the storm giant Tempest Caller. This is also one of the rune carvers. These are among the highest ranking storm giants, known for their mastery of rune magic and their position up at the very top of the ordning hierarchy. They use storm rune crystals to see through magical deception, and they have the ability to conjure storms of freezing winds and clouds that engulf their enemies in elemental fury. They also implant crystal balls into their foreheads or their eye sockets, which give them scrying powers. The Tempest Caller is very mobile in about any kind of terrain. It's amphibious, it can fly, it is alert, preventing it from ever being surprised and giving it advantage on initiative checks. It has legendary resistance, a lightning blade, and a lightning lance that has a stupendous 500 foot range. It is classified as a sorcerer, and it does have some spells, including Time Stop, Plane Shift, Dispel Magic, and Control Weather, with a one action casting time instead of the normal 10 minutes. And to tie the powers and the themes all together, it can use its magical rune to call up an elemental vortex that churns an enormous 60 foot radius around the giant. Combine these amazing features with a terrific style, nearly unlimited possibilities for role-playing and motivations, we get a well-deserving king of this ranking for glory of the giants. As usual, S-tier did not have many creatures in it. 
I keep the requirements very high in order to really give this rank prestige and a mark of true excellence. The monsters in this book are largely C and B tier, though there are a fair number of them in D tier. I can't say this is really any different than any other 5e monster book. Some details and some design approaches are different, but in terms of overall monster quality, it's more or less on par. Do I like it better than any other bestiary in 5th edition? Probably not. One thing I do really appreciate about this book are the full page illustrations. They don't have any text or anything else overlaying them, just the entire pages devoted to scenes of adventure and fantasy that we can take in and appreciate and let it spark our imaginations. I also very much like the section about giant layers. They are great to set up adventures and design really cool encounters. One thing that I do find odd, though, is how I should implement the maps here. They are evocative black and white maps done by Dyson Logos, who does most 5e maps of this kind. But how am I supposed to get the maps from this book onto a physical table or a virtual tabletop? I haven't found any official source to get them as JPEGs or some other digital image file, but what I did find was this on the D&D website. Glory of the Giants for your D&D Beyond account. Buy all the content, or buy just chunks of the content for smaller amounts. Three bucks for two backgrounds, two bucks for one subclass, eight bucks for eight feats, fifteen bucks for the monsters, or just two bucks per monster if you want to buy them one at a time. Twenty bucks to unlock the compendium content only, which apparently includes the artwork and maps. I don't see that there's any way for me to just access this, since I picked up the book at a small local gaming store. Or it looks like I can also subscribe to the master tier version of D&D Beyond and get access to the alpha version of their new maps tool, which really does not have a very in-depth description of what exactly is in this tool. As someone who both creates and backs projects on Kickstarter, I'm quite familiar with supporting things that are still in the works. I'm also familiar with how important it is to really show people what it is that they're spending their money on. I'm going to have to assume that the Glory of the Giants layer maps are not in this D&D website maps tool, and maybe they'll get added later, and if they do, I'll only be able to use them through this Alpha State Wizards of the Coast browser-based tool? I guess nothing just comes right out and clearly states it. Can't I just get JPEGs or PDFs of the damn maps. I already spent 60 bucks on your book. I guess we'll just have to wait till someone on Patreon or Reddit makes their own renditions of these giant layers. But that is just the tip of the iceberg with my criticisms about this book. Though it is good in some ways, it's also not so good in some ways. The minimal lore, the passive verbiage and the stat blocks, the weapons that mysteriously all deal this extra elemental damage, the sterile and cartoon-looking monsters, the monsters tagged as character classes without any of the class features or spells, the monsters that do have spells often get so few of them, and a lot of the time they're not very combat useful ones. There's a complete lack of legendary actions, and there's a continual use of the same effects and conditions over and over again. It sort of reminds me of a 4th edition bestiary in some ways. Plus, there is the breaking of established conventions and the rebooting of established characters. It reminds me of the sludge of Star Wars or superhero movies and shows where any rule can be broken at any time. Any character can be swapped out for a different version. Nothing means anything. It's all just this multiverse, and all the struggles and sacrifices of the characters in previous generations are rendered meaningless. After I recorded this entire narration, someone commented on part one of this ranking, stating that the book does mention the fact that many monsters wield weapons that deal energy damage. If you look in the introduction to the bestiary, there is a paragraph in which it states, herein you'll find weapons that deal unusual damage types and spellcasting that functions in atypical ways. Such an exception is a special feature of a monster and represents how it uses the weapon or casts its spells. The exception has no effect on how a weapon or a spell functions for others. It's easy to overlook this little paragraph, 
but at least the designers did include a clarification that the characters or even other monsters cannot use the magical aspects of these weapons. It's not very satisfying though, because if you look, there are 29 monsters in this bestiary that wield handheld melee weapons, and 26 out of the 29 deal energy damage with their weapons. So it's not true to describe it as exceptions or atypical or unusual when practically all the melee warrior monsters have this same behind the scenes feature. It comes off as really contrived when all these monsters just somehow mysteriously have this same power. For unspecified reasons, warrior monsters all get 2d8 or 2d10 or 4d8 extra energy damage on their weapon attacks, and simultaneously no monsters have magical attacks anymore. Not even a scion of a god or a great worm dragon. This doesn't ruin the book or anything, but it is just another wonky thing on a growing list of wonky things. But what bugs me most about this book is probably the minimal lore about the giants. Now I want to give credit where credit is due. Glory of the Giants does give some interesting bits about giant history in general, or about the Ordning and the giant gods. It also provides some really cool adventure hooks and encounter ideas involving giants. And again, there is that really cool section about the giant enclaves that are part layer, part battle map, part terrain effects, part adventure hook. That section in particular I thought was fantastic. But there really is such a scarcity of actual stories about the giants. Lore in the true sense. There are no stories about specific Fomorian nobles or cloud giant oracles and who they were and what impacts they had. There's no legend of a mighty fire giant who developed some new kind of weapon or technology. No deep dive into a historical tale of two giant clans divided against one another and all the various schemes and battles and world-changing consequences of their feuding. There's almost nothing, just scraps and crumbs here and there. From time to time, people comment that I'm playing the wrong game. They say that I need to try this system or that one. Now, I do actually enjoy trying out all kinds of RPGs and games, but really what I wonder sometimes is if I need to focus more on being an author, a writer of short stories and novels, where I can go deep into the characters and the lore and the stories. Well, I won't ramble on with my personal musings here. Glory of the Giants? Uh, I say somewhat coolness of the Giants. Take it or leave it. I want to say thank you to all my supporters over on Patreon. In particular, Adam Wood, Vince Villelli, Nick Thy Pirate King, Locke Monroe, and Nicholas A. These guys and everyone else there play an important role in making it possible for me to do this content. And if you yourself are not yet a patron, please have a look and consider it. There are some really cool exclusive rewards every month, and you'll get to play a part in supporting this kind of in-depth RPG content here on YouTube. Until we meet again, my brave companions, if you come across any giants on your adventures, best of luck on stealing their magical weapons. And as always, may your adventures be many.